This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. All right, we're now moving on to the section of the syllabus um, on business finance and business valuations. And um, what we're going to go through first are what we call sources of finance, uh, because um, as we've explained in earlier chapters, um, any business needs to raise long-term finance. And there are two ways they can raise it. They can either raise, uh, if they need more finance, they can either raise it from shareholders, uh, equity issue more shares, or they can uh, raise more finance by taking out long-term loans, uh, debt finance. And so, uh, get me separate chapters um, this first set of lectures is on chapter 11, where we'll look at um, equity finance. Uh, the next chapter, we'll look at ways of raising debt finance, long-term loans. And in the third chapter, we'll discuss uh, why they might prefer, if they need to raise more money, why they might prefer to uh, use equity finance, shareholders' money, or why they might prefer to raise debt finance, long-term loans. So first of all, let's talk about um, uh, equity finance, which is chapter 11 of the free lecture notes. Um, and we're talking about raising money from shareholders. You know, we've got a company, we need to raise another 100,000. We want to uh, buy new machines. Uh, different ways in which we can get the money effectively from the shareholders, from the equity. And how they raise the money uh, depends to a large extent on whether it's already a quoted company, you know, a big company whose shares are traded on, current shares are traded on the stock exchange, or uh, whether it's an unquoted company, a small company whose shares aren't traded on the stock exchange. Now, I, I don't read every word of the notes to you. I mean, I'll run through, but uh, read it properly yourself after. But first of all, uh, paragraph 2.1, if they're a quoted company, uh, then there are various ways in which they can issue new shares. They can either have what we call a public issue, uh, where they advertise new shares for issue, and anyone can buy the shares. What they tend to do is put an advert in the uh, financial press saying, we're issuing this many new shares, this is the price, and you fill in a form saying how many shares you want, uh, you send the money with it, you send the check, uh, and off we go. Uh, so that's a public issue. Uh, we don't, I'm not worried here about all the um, legal aspects of it, this isn't a law exam, but a public issue offering shares for sale to the public. Uh, with a standard public issue, there's a fixed price per share. You know, we'll say we're offering this many shares for sale. The price is $5 per share. And, you know, you say, well, I'll buy 100 shares. Somebody else says I'll buy 200 and so on. Um, the alternative is a public offer for sale by tender, uh, where you don't fix a price. You say we're... Um, offering a million shares for sale. Um, if you want to buy the shares, you fill in the form and say, oh, I, I want to buy 100 shares, or I want to buy 200 of the shares. And you state how much you're prepared to pay. So I might say, oh, I'll buy 100 shares and I'll offer two pounds a share, two dollars a share, I'm sorry. Uh, somebody else might say, I'll buy 200 shares and I'll offer three dollars a share. And they collect it all in, and they find which price would mean that all the shares are sold. So what I'm getting at is a small example. Suppose there are a thousand shares being issued. And they get various offers. They get one person saying, um, oh, I'll buy a hundred and I'll offer five dollars a share. Um, maybe other people in total uh, want 400 and they're offering four dollars a share. Maybe, I mean obviously be a lot more than a thousand, I want to keep this short. 
uh, but maybe other people. Uh, there are several people offering three dollars a share, and in total, uh, they want to buy five hundred. And you've got other people offering two dollars a share. In total, they want to buy six hundred. So you've got all these people sending in their forms saying how many shares they want to buy. And people are offering different prices. So when they come to um, actually issue the shares, they say, all right, what's the maximum price we can charge? If we charge five dollars, we won't sell the thousand. We'll only sell a uh, hundred. On the other hand, if we charge four dollars, then anybody who offered four dollars or more will get shares. And they'll all pay four dollars. But if we if it's four dollars, then in total we'll sell five hundred. That's not enough, we've got a thousand. And so let's go down. What happens if we offer uh, if we charge three dollars a share? Ah. Anybody offering three dollars or more will get shares, and that will sell us the full thousand. So they'll fix the price at three dollars, and everybody will pay three dollars. So even the people who uh, were offering five dollars, they'll still only be charged three dollars uh, for the share. We will be issuing a thousand at three dollars each. And if they've already sent in the money, you know, five dollars, uh, they'll get the remaining two dollars refunded. And these people who only offered two dollars, uh, they won't get given any shares. And if they'd sent the money in, well, they'll get the money back. So that's an offer for sale by tender. Uh, which is quite a neat idea because it's very hard to decide often uh, with a public issue what a fair price is. You obviously want to charge as much as, the company wants to charge as much as they can, but if they charge too much per share, they won't sell them all. And so it's very difficult to decide what a price to uh, issue the shares at. Well, an offer by tender, you're much more certain to sell all the shares. Uh, again, here we'd end up issuing them at $3. But bear in mind, everybody would pay $3, even if they'd offered more. Everybody gets charged the price that's eventually fixed, so as to make sure we sell all the shares. Uh, a placing. Again, the new shares being offered, but this is where um, a merchant bank gets involved, and they arrange right from the beginning that uh, their clients will buy shares so we're much more guaranteed to sell them. We know in advance that uh, this merchant bank are going to buy them for their clients. But as it says, at least 25% must be available to the general public, which is getting into a bit much detail. Uh, you're not asked in fine detail in paper F9. Uh, it starts going into the legal side of it, which you're not interested in. Well, that is a new, in one way or another, whether it's public issue, offer by tender or placing, it's issuing new shares to new people. The other way though, much more common in practice, is what we call a rights issue, where instead of going to the expense of having to advertise this new issue, it is expensive, there are a lot of formalities involved, or doing it through a merchant bank, but they'll charge a fee, uh, a much easier, cheaper way of doing it is a rights issue. And I think you should be aware from earlier exams that a rights issue is an offer of new shares to existing shareholders. So again, instead of going through all the expense and the formalities of offering new shares to the uh, to anybody, to the general public, a rights issue, instead of going through all that business, they simply write to all the existing shareholders and ask them if they want to buy some new shares. So it's a lot cheaper. Uh, the new shareholders don't have to buy the new shares. 
You'll see later I'll put some numbers to this. But they all get a letter saying, will you buy some new shares? We're charging $2 a share or whatever. And then you know, the shareholders fill in the form and say, yes, we will, or for that matter, no, we won't. Now, when there is this rights issue, though, it has to be offered fairly. What I mean is, you can't offer all the new shares just to one shareholder. All shareholders, all existing shareholders, have to be offered new shares. And when I say fairly, it's always of the form, for example, you might have a one for four rights issue. And what that means is uh, the shareholders are offered one new share for every four existing shares. And so if somebody currently owns 100 shares, they'll get a letter saying they're entitled to buy well, the one for every four, so a quarter of a hundred, they're entitled to buy 25 new shares. On the other hand, if another shareholder currently owns 2,000 shares, their letter, one for every four, they'll be get a letter offering them 500 new shares. So that's what I mean by fairly. Uh, the more shares you've uh, currently got, the more new shares you'll be offered. And as I say, you just get this letter from the company saying you're entitled to buy, in this case, 500 new shares. Um, and again, it's up to you whether you buy them or not. If you don't want them, you can throw the letter away, or in fact, as you'll see later, you can sell the letter to somebody else and they can buy the shares. I'll deal with that shortly. So you don't have to buy them. Uh, or, uh, or you can buy any part. I'm entitled to buy 500. Maybe I can't afford it. I might, I might say, oh, well, I'll just buy 200. As many as I want, up to the maximum I've been offered. So you fill in the form, send your money and get your new shares. So. As I say, that's uh, a lot cheaper and quicker than having a public issue. Um, to a large extent, it depends how much money you're trying to raise. If you're trying to raise millions, maybe you're not going to get that from existing shareholders. You'll have to have a public issue. Um, depends on how big the company currently is as to... Um, to what extent it limits the amount you can raise. Uh, that's quoted companies when they're issuing new shares. Uh, unquoted companies, a smaller company that's not currently listed on the stock exchange, is well, they can't really have a public issue. I mean, they're entitled to find new shareholders. But whereas for a large public company, Everybody knows it's quoted on the stock exchange. It's relatively easy to find new shareholders. For a little company like mine, it'll be very hard for me to find people who are prepared to buy new shares. You know, nobody's heard of me. Uh, and so, uh, really, the way a, a small company would raise money, they're rather limited to having a rights issue they'll write to existing shareholders and again ask them to buy new shares. Um, however, there is this problem that on the one hand, an unquoted, a small company finds it much harder to raise finance than a large quoted company, equity finance. And yet, a small company can't become a big company unless they are quoted on the stock exchange. And you can't be quoted on the stock exchange unless you're already a big company. They have limits. 
So my little company, my shares can't be traded on the stock exchange. I'm not big enough. I say they have limit uh, rules. The company must be this big before the shares can be quoted. And yet, how am I going to become a big company when it's hard for me, much harder for me, to raise more shareholder money? And so, and this is what the, oh, in paragraph 2.2, .2, when it says become quoted, how do I become a big company? Well, in fact, certainly in the UK and in most countries these days, there are two stock exchanges where shares are traded. There's the main stock exchange, and that's where you have to already be a big company. You don't need to know the limits. We have to have a certain amount of turnover and so on to be able to have your shares traded on the, big, the main stock exchange. However, to enable or to help small companies become big companies, there's also what they call the Alternative Investment Market, or AIM. It's written there in full, the Alternative Investment Market which is another stock exchange, shares are traded on it, but the limits are much smaller. There are limits. You have to have got to a certain size before you're allowed to have your shares quoted. But it's, it's for small, medium-sized companies. And what happens is they go on the alternative investment market and their shares then are traded, it does become easier to raise money from new shareholders. But companies never intend to stay there. They go on this stock exchange so that they can... It's a bit, that bit more easy for them to get new shareholders and grow, but the intention is always, when they go on this stock exchange, it's, the intention is always to be able to grow, to be big enough to move on to the main stock exchange. So, there's already probably too much detail there for paper F9, but do be aware, if they're issuing new shares, if you are asked to write anything, check whether it's a big quoted company or it's a small unquoted company you know, if it's a small unquoted company, there's no point in saying, oh, have a public issue. It's just not realistic. Uh, if it's a big quoted company, yes. Be clear about, in both cases, what we mean by a rights issue. And be aware of what I, I just said about the alternative investment market. Uh, this smaller stock exchange to help you turn into a big company and go on the main stock exchange. All right, well, all of that was just chat. The first bit of numbers, though, that goes with this chapter relates to rights issues. I've already explained what a rights issue is, an issue of shares to existing shareholders. One for every four, one for every five, two for every 22 or something. This one has a really funny ones. But... What you can uh, be asked, what is regularly asked, is if it is a quoted company, if they have a rights issue, then what will happen to the share price on the stock exchange? Let me explain with example one, which is on the second page of the notes. We've got a company whose current share price is $5 per share. And they're going to make a new issue. They're having a rights issue. One for four. So I've already explained that. There'll be one new share offered for every four that people already own. And the issue price, they're being issued at $3. Why are they offering new shares at $3 when the share price on the stock exchange is $5? 
Well, they always offer at a price a bit lower than the current price. Because think about it, if, 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 if you wanted some new shares in this company, you can buy them on the stock exchange at $5. You'd already have bought them at $5 if you wanted more. You're not going to be particularly thrilled if I send you a letter saying, will you buy new shares at $5? Again, if you wanted them, you'd already have bought them. So they're always offered at a, a price a bit lower to encourage you to buy the shares. Obviously, if they're getting offered at three dollars, you're more likely to say, OK, I'll buy some. Well, part A says, what is the theoretical X rights value per share? Well, theoretical is what's the value in theory. I'll tell you what happens in practice uh, afterwards. When he says X rights, it means what will the market value be per share after having the rights issue? Because always these new shares are the same type of share as the existing ones. It's just there are more of them. They're saying what will happen to the share price on the stock exchange? And some people learn a formula, which I think is awful, because you're not given it. If you see the logic, it's actually very easy. Just suppose somebody currently owns four shares. Four. Four shares. Well, what's going to happen? If you currently own four shares, your current wealth you've got four shares the market value currently is five dollars per share you're worth twenty dollars uh, because you own four shares you uh, uh, get offered uh, the rights issue you're entitled to one new share. Same type of shares, so instead of having four shares, assuming you buy the, take up the rights, you'll now have one more. And you're having to pay $3 for that share. And so what's going to happen? You end up with five shares. And in theory, there's no reason why you should end up being worth any more or any less. So to be worth the same, well, you were worth 20, you've paid in another three to buy this share, you need to be worth $23. And therefore, the new share price or the theoretical price after the rights issue, the theoretical X rights price. If every five shares are going to be worth $23, uh, the price per share, 23 divided by five, is $4.60. Now that's the price in theory, theory there's no reason why you should suddenly be worth more or suddenly be worth less. In theory, in total, you're worth the same, which is 460. And see what will happen, you see, on your existing shares, they were worth five and now they're only worth 460. You've lost 40 cents a share. Four shares at 40 cents, you've lost a dollar sixty. But on the other hand, You've paid $3 for a new share, which is now worth $4.60 on the stock exchange. That's gained you $1.60. So the net effect, you're no better off, you're no worse off. Uh, there is the theoretical X rights price. Uh, it's theoretical. Uh, in practice, you would normally expect the X rights price to end up a bit higher. And the reason is that you see, why is this company raising more money? You know, they might have, there might be um, 
100,000 new shares being issued, and if it's a three dollars each, that gives them three hundred thousand dollars. What are they going to do with the money? Presumably, they're going to invest it to grow the company, buy new machines, etc. And if they're investing it well, well, the more people think the company's doing better, the higher the share price will go. So in practice, um, the actual share price will usually be higher than the theoretical price. Uh, but in, and we can discuss that uh, again in a later chapter, how we might deal with it. But in the exam, when you're asked for the theoretical price, it's 460. But if there is any written, be prepared to say it'll probably end up a bit more than 460 because hopefully uh, shareholders will think the money's being invested well. Now that's part A. However, I did say earlier that although you get this letter offering you new shares, you don't have to buy them. It's your choice. And if you don't want to buy them, you can, if you want, just throw the letter away and ignore it. However, when it's again a quoted company, um, you can sell the letter to somebody else. And somebody else is then entitled to buy the share at three dollars. You can give the letter away if you want, but the letter offering the rights, they are quoted as well on the stock exchange and you're entitled to sell it to somebody else. Well, why would somebody else buy this letter off you? You have a letter that entitles you to buy a new share at $3. And yet we know, in theory, the share price will end up at $4.60. And so, somebody else, surely, if they want this letter off you, you'll charge them for it. And how much are they prepared to pay? What is the value of this rights letter? Well, the new share price after the rights have been issued, the theoretical X rights price, we've said is 460. Anybody uh, taking this letter off you? will get a share worth 460. They'll only have to pay the three dollars, the price at which they were issued at. So the cost of taking up the rights is three dollars. And therefore, surely, <laughs> again in theory, anybody buying the letter from you will be prepared to pay a dollar sixty for it. And so if you want my letter, you'll pay me a dollar sixty for the letter. You'll then use it and pay the company three dollars to take up the new share. In total, you'll have ended up paying out 460 and you've got a share worth 460. Uh, again, in practice, the, um, the rights letter will probably be slightly less than 160 because, you know, on the theoretical values, if it was exactly 160 and then you had to fill in the piece of paper and pay $3, 460, you might as well just have waited and bought a share on the stock exchange at 460. So to make it worth your while buying the letter from me, I'll probably charge slightly less. But in the exam, what they're after is the theoretical exercise price, 460. The theoretical value of the rights, the difference between uh, the exercise price and the cost of taking up the rights. Uh, just one tiny thing here, and be careful in the exam, read it carefully. That $1.60 is the value per new share. For every new share in this rights issue, 
you'd be prepared to pay 160 for the letter. So it's 160 per new share. How many shares did you need to have in order to get that letter? Well, this was one for four, if you remember. So to be entitled to have the right to buy one new share, you needed to have four existing shares. And so the value per existing share Well, uh, each new share, the right to each new share is worth $1.60. To get that right, you needed four existing shares. Uh, and so the value per existing share uh, would be uh, 40 cents. So check carefully in the exam. This makes a lovely two mark question. Uh, but check if they want the value of the rights. Is it asked for per new share, answer $1.60, or is it asked for per existing share, uh, $0.40? Cents. OK, let's look at example two, which is the same exercise, different figures. Let's check we've got it, but then just slightly more which again has been asked in the exam. In example two, the current share price, $8 per share. They're having a rights issue, this time it's one for three. Uh, and the price, $6 per share. Again, always a bit less than the uh, existing share price. So I'll set it out the same way as before. Suppose you currently have three shares. Choose any number you want. I've chosen three because it divides, but it doesn't matter. Choose 300 if you want. Choose 3,000. It's just anything. Well, the uh, value of your current shares you have three shares, the current share price is $8. And so your shares, your wealth uh, at the moment is $24. Um, as a rights issue, and you're offered one for every three, so this is why I chose three, um, one new share. And how much are you having to pay for it? $6. And so assuming you uh, took up the rights, you end up with four shares in total for there to be no gain, no loss. You must then be worth $30. And so in theory, what's the theoretical X rights price? If four shares are going to end up being worth 30, all the shares, the market value will end up 30 divided by 4 is what? At $7.50. That's the new market value of all the shares. Remember, they're all the same sort of share. And so although your three existing shares are each worth less, they were worth 8, they're now worth $7.50, so you've lost 50 cents, a total of $1.50. On the other hand, your new share, you only paid 6 it's now worth 750. You've made a gain of 150. The net effect, you know better off, you know worse off. So, yeah, I say same as before, just with different figures. So there's the, new, the X rights price. Part B, the value of a right. It's the difference between the X rights price of $7.50 and the cost of taking up the rights.
uh, which was six dollars. So again, if you don't want to take up the rights, you can sell the letter and somebody else can do it. In theory, the value would be 150. But again, be careful. The letter is worth 150 per exit per new share. Or the other way of expressing it. How many uh, shares did you uh, need to have to be able to get offered the right? It was one for three, so three existing shares. So the other way is to say it's 50 cents per existing share. So we have to be clear what we mean by that, the value of the rights. You get the letter if you want, you buy the shares and pay your six dollars, and all your shares end up being worth seven fifty. If you don't want to take up the rights, you don't pay for them, but you simply sell your letter, uh, and you can sell it one fifty for every new share. All right, uh, the bit that's extra though, part C, it says Mrs. X owns 1,200 shares. So she'll be, uh, get this right side, so one for three, she'll be offered 400 shares. I said earlier, you can take up all the shares if you want. If you don't want, you can sell all the rights, or you can take up however many of them you want and sell the others. And it says here, Mrs. X takes up half her rights and sells the other half. So how many is she offered? She's got 1,200 shares, so she'll be offered It's one for three. So she's offered 400 new shares. Uh, she can't afford them all, perhaps, but for whatever reason, she'll take up half of them, which is 200, and the other 200, she'll sell the rights for the other 200. And it says, consider the effect it will be on her wealth. Well, you can set this out several ways, but I think the neatest, the most obvious is this way. What's she currently worth? Well, currently she's got 1,200 shares. And before all this happens, what's the share price? It's $8. So she's currently worth 9,600. After the rights issue, what's her new wealth going to be? Well, as far as her shareholding is concerned, she'll end up, she had 1,200 shares, she took up half the rights, another 200, so she's now got 1,400 shares. And what's the new market value per share going to be? The TERP, where was it? 750. So after this happens, she's got 1,400 shares. 750 per share. Her shareholding is now worth 10,500. However, of course, although her shares are now worth 10,400, what about the effect on her cash balance? And there are two effects. <coughs> First of all, she had to pay out cash for those rights that she did take up. P 
paid for rights taken Well, she took up 200 of the new shares. And how much did she have to pay? It was $6 per share. So she's paid out cash of 1200 Now, the other effect, though, is the other 200 shares, she sold the rights. So the 200 she didn't take up, how much did she sell the rights for? Well, the value of the rights we worked out. Every new share was $1.50. And so, although she's had to pay out for those shares, the, the, the rights that she actually took up, the other 200, she'll receive cash, she'll receive 300. And so the net effect on her cash balance, her cash will fall by 900. So what's the overall effect on her wealth? Well, okay, her shares are worth 10.5, but her cash has gone down by 900. The net effect 9,600, which of course, if you understood what I said earlier, is sensible. In theory, shareholders will end up no better off, no worse off, as a result of the rights issue. And that's quite useful, you see, because different individuals have different views. I mean, some people might want to take up all the rights. They'll have more shares, but they've paid out more cash. Others may not want any new shares at all, maybe they can't afford them, in which case they'd sell all the rights and receive more cash. But try any, what you might call, combination you like. In theory, using theoretical X rights price, the net effect will be the shareholder will be no better off, no worse off. All right, I'm going to add a part D to give you a little puzzle. It's something that the examiner doesn't normally ask, but he could, because it is practical. Certainly in the UK, whenever there's a rights issue, the financial pages of newspapers I always tell you what percent of the rights you should take up for your cash balance not to change. You know, because a lot of people, they get a rights issue, a lot of people don't want to have to spend any more cash. And yet at the same time, aren't worried about receiving cash. And so, they can achieve it by taking up some of the rights, selling the rest of the rights, but in such a way as to end up with no effect on the cash balance. And the newspapers, as I say, they always publish, oh, for your cash balance not to change, you should take up 80% of the rights, or 60% of the rights, or whatever it is. And so my part D that I'm adding what percent of the rights, remember she's, she's offered, uh, what was it, 400 in part B, she took up 50% and sold the other 50%. Well, I want to know what percent of those 400 should Mrs. X what was that? Yeah, Mrs. X take up for there to be no effect on her cash balance.
Now I wish you were here with me because I'd make you have a go at that yourself before I go through it. And I can't make you obviously. It would be a good idea if you paused the lecture and did have a go at, you, at it yourself before I go through it. Anyway, whether you paused the lecture and had a go or you didn't, I will now go through it. There are two ways you could do it. The way a lot of people do is start using algebra and saying, oh, well, let's suppose she takes up x percent and ending up with an equation. <coughs> you can. But there's actually no need. The reason is this. We already know that her current wealth, before doing all this, she currently has 1,200 shares uh, with uh, a current share price of $8. She's currently worth 9,600. I've shown you, well, I've said several times, and I've shown you that in theory, her total wealth won't change. So her new wealth, <coughs> is the combination of the value of the shares, plus the change in the cash balance. But it must in total be the same, 9,600. Look at the last one. Her new wealth was the value of her shares now, together with, in this case, the fall in the cash balance. But in total, no gain, no loss, it must be 9,6. Well, back to the word, this part D I gave you. Although in total she must be worth 9,6. She wants the change in her cash balance to be zero. The net effect. She'll pay out money to take up rights. She'll receive money by selling some of the rights. But the net effect, she wants no change in the cash balance. Therefore, the new value of the shares must be 9,600 in total. But how much of the shares, what's the value of the shares going to be after the issue? The new value, we worked out the theoretical x rights price, what was it? 750. So since the shares in future are going to be worth 750 each, and since in total her shares will have to be worth 9,600, she must now have 9,600 divided by 750. She must have 1,280 shares. We're not there yet, because you must end up with 1280 shares. Remember, she already had 1200, so she must have taken up 1280, she used to have 1200. She must have taken up 80 new shares. How many was she entitled to? Checked earlier, it was a one for three issue, so she was offered 400 new shares. And so she must take up 80 and sell the other, the rights to the other 320. Well, I said what percent of the rights issue should she take up? She'll take up 80 out of the 400 she was offered, which is 20% of the rights. Now, I'll prove it to you that it works in the exam, though, if it was asked. You don't waste time proving it. 
But if she takes up 20% of the rights, then she will have 20, uh, whoa, 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 whoa. an extra 80 shares. She will have 1280 shares. Value at 750. She'll, the shares will be worth 9,600. There'll be no effect on her cash balance. And let's just check her cash. Let me prove it to you. On the one hand, she pays for the rights. She's only taking up 80. Uh, and the cost of taking them up is $6 per share. So she'll pay out cash of 480. Uh, the other 320, she'll sell the rights. So the other 320, she won't buy the shares, she'll simply sell the rights letter. And the value of the letter, the value of the rights was $1.50 for every new share. So how much cash will she receive by selling the letter? $320 to $1.50. 480. The net effect on her cash, zero. So a nice little extra bit that you just could throw in. Uh, parts A and B are asked very regularly, almost certainly just as two mark questions. Um, parts C and D, particularly D, make it a bit more interesting. All right, we're not quite there, but to avoid the, uh, this lecture getting too long, I'll split the chapter in two. So this was part one for chapter whatever it was, 11. Uh, the next lecture, I'll go through the uh, remaining two pages.